Hello, hi everyone. Welcome to the February wrap up. I feel like I say this every year, but February is consistently the shortest month, even though it is a leap year this year. It's still the shortest month, but it always feels so long to me. And so once again, looking at the books in the beginning of this month, I'm sort of like, wow, that all happened. <laughs> In February so this month once again I read a lot of arcs that are coming out um, for this video I'm gonna continue doing it the way that I've always done it which is I talk about books chronologically in terms of the first book I read all the way down to the last book um, but let me know if you want me to separate out the arcs I was thinking of doing them in a separate like in the last part of the wrap-up or something let me know but I'm gonna just start it off chronologically for February just to keep it as it's always been and I even have I even have some physicals to talk about which is crazy um, before we dive in though I want to give a shout out to the sponsor of this video which happens to have brought me a book that I really liked this month that I read. Uh, it was a January pick, so let me blast you to the future where I have some new books in my hands. Yes, hello. So this video is brought to you by the wonderful Book of the Month. You know them by now. Book of the Month is a book subscription service where a team of readers comb through all the new releases, which could be debut authors, authors that you know and love. I will tell you who is uh, maybe on the March list. They pick their top books of totally different genres. In February, I read one of their January picks and it was a thriller. Sometimes I have read memoirs, as you will see, like I'm trying to branch out. So there's something for everyone. You can pause your subscription at any time they're always going to be hardcover and it's always going to be a low controlled price so right now for March you can use the code chirp like a little spring bird use chirp to get your first book for $9.99 and when I tell you about some of the choices the first one I got is Annie bot this is apparently for fans of Never Let Me Go and My Dark Vanessa. I've never read My Dark Vanessa, but I love Never Let Me Go. It's about basically a perfect girlfriend robot and what happens when she's not really that perfect and what does perfect mean, etc. Um, very excited to dive into this. And then my next pick is Hereafter by Amy Lynn. This is a debut memoir. I'm trying to get more into nonfiction and memoirs this month um, or this year, so um, I'm very excited to give this one a try as well. I will also say so you can pick one, two, or more titles every single month, and one of the picks for this month that you can add on is a fate inked in blood which I know a lot of you guys are really interested in so if you want to get that hardcover for $9.99 book of the month you can use my code chirp it will all be in the description box thank you as always to book of the month for supporting this channel you know I love you so much love to you always so let's get back to my wrap-up and now to dive in to what I read in February starting off the reason why I was asking about should I talk about arcs at a different point uh, is because we're starting off with an arc mm, and we're starting off with a DNF. Um, this book was highly anticipated. I still recommend you giving it a try, but I was just really confused and just kind of disappointed in it, to be honest. This is, I'm scared to even talk about it, but this is To Gaze Upon Wicked Gods. This had some issues <laughs> for me right off the bat. So one thing that surprised me is with the arc, there is an author's note at the very front, which I feel like is becoming a trend. We're getting a lot of like author's notes slash disclaimers plus trigger warnings at the front of the book, which I feel like is usually a really good thing. I think trigger warnings across the board is in the beginning is a good thing. But this author's note actually made me really confused and, and eventually disappointed in the book because the author talks about how this book is inspired by all the stories that she heard from her grandfather and she always thought that these were like kind of mythical legends and there were just these monsters and stuff like that but her grandfather was from Manchuria and she slowly began to realize that no the monsters were actually real people and 
all of these stories are true. And so she talked about how this book was inspired a lot by the Japanese occupation of Manchuria. The Japanese did horrific, unspeakable things to the people of Manchuria, and it's something that, especially coming from the West, from, coming from the US, we never learned about. And so I was really excited, especially like living in Korea, I feel like I've learned so much about that era and the Japanese Empire. I'm also sorry if my throat is a little sore, but we're pushing through. I was really excited for a fantasy to talk about what happened in Manchuria with the Japanese, and that's what the author's note seemed to promise. And then we start reading it, and it's about a girl with magical powers from this kind of mythical place, and it's being colonized by a power that they're just called the Romans. They're just from Rome. I was like, well... <laughs> okay, so we're like not talking about the Japanese, we're talking about the Roman Empire, and like all the people had names like Augustus and like Caesar. Like very clearly we're, we're doing ancient Rome. So, okay. The story very heavily relies on like drug usage. And so then I was like, okay, well then, then is it about the opium wars and like what the Western powers did very much do to China. Both things are of value. It just confused me that the author's note said one thing and not the other. Just in terms of the world building, I guess this was sort of my fault, but they were talking about the Romans colonized and like appeared and took over via airships and like this magical portal in the sky. For some reason that didn't translate into like, oh, they must have other technologies as well because for the beginning of the story, it seems like we're in kind of like a technology-less society in this kind of unknown time period, but it didn't feel very techy, except for the weird airships that are vaguely talked about in the beginning. And then all of a sudden, like 50 pages in, we have a scene where suddenly our main character is in a car. And something about that, I was just like, <laughs> why are like what is the tech like like how advanced what are we dealing with i just could not get a sense of the world and it was shaping up very clearly to be a colonizer and colonized romance i didn't i just what else did i write honestly yeah those were all my notes i just think that it was i just couldn't understand what we were aiming for here, like, we had these kingdom names that seem to be made up or maybe, like, linked to a mythology that I just don't know, but then we also have ancient Romans, but the ancient Romans have cars and airplanes or, like, spaceships, but then, like, all the people of, like, this mythical Manchuria don't seem to have any technology. I just, <laughs> I honestly feel like if I had just gone in fresh, I would have been like, this is kind of weird, but let's push through. But for some reason going in expecting like, oh my gosh, people are finally gonna learn about the Japanese empire. Mm. So let me know your thoughts. I DNF'd it. Did I write down when I DNF'd it? I didn't write down the percentage, but I pretty much got to the scene where she was in a car. I am so, I was lost, honestly. So that's to gaze upon Wicked Gods. Please let me know your thoughts and if I just had a weird reading experience because maybe there are times when like I'm reading and my mind is just kind of all over the place and perhaps I just like couldn't sink into it the way that other people would. So again, I'm not saying don't read it. I'm just saying I found the author's note and then what the actual content was to not gel. And I think that put me in the wrong mindset. So that's To Gaze Upon Wicked Gods coming out this year. I will put it up above. Um, please talk to me because that was a highly anticipated read. Thank you. Next up is a book that I had been waiting for for a really long time. I had it on hold at the library, and this is Brutes. It was toted as being a mixture of the Virgin Suicides and I think Bunny, which I haven't read, but I did actually recently read The Virgin Suicides. It definitely has that feel. It's about this small community where one girl goes missing and we are learning about the story through the eyes of these girls who are about a year or so younger than her in school. It's like this little friend group, this little squad, 
and they are obsessed with the girl who has gone missing and based on the way that they're telling the story they seem to know where she went and no one else does so we're like watching the search party and then we're also getting these flashbacks told by the girls and so it very much felt like the virgin suicides how we have that story being told by these boys who are just kind of obsessed with the girls very similar i really enjoyed it especially the 60 percent mark and then it took an almost magical realism turn, which I could have kind of, I could have done without, you know? Um, but for the majority of the book, I really liked it. It had, similar to The Virgin Suicides, just these like the weird rituals that teens and preteens have and like how certain objects can have like such a magic to them, even if it's just like a shared mechanical pencil <laughs> like within the group you know like something so mundane but like almost a holy object and it really had that kind of just creepiness and almost like cult-like feel that a close friendship of very young girls can have um so it was just really wonderful writing and wonderful details and i didn't love the ending um like i said it took a turn that i could have done without but Overall, I still really recommend it if you like that kind of writing. Again, I haven't read Bunny, but definitely a Virgin Suicides companion book, I would say, and that is Brutes. Next up, this was a book that I found from the comment section of either an Instagram or a TikTok. So thank you to the people who did the work to get this book in my hands. I read most ardently. This was really cute. This is a Pride and Prejudice retelling, almost a, an exact retelling, okay? However, it is a story of if Lizzie Bennet was actually a trans boy named Oliver. Everybody is kind of aged down, I think, or maybe just like the Jane Austen characters feel old, <laughs> but these are definitely teenagers. We have Oliver and again we have like the same cast and crew right we have Charlotte Bingley and Jane have like the same story if you know what I mean but really the change is with Oliver and Darcy I think there might be some historical inaccuracies like if you look really hard in terms of vocabulary that they use or something like that um but it was just a sweet good time I will say though just as like a warning um, because Oliver is not out to anyone other than basically Jane and Charlotte for most of the book. He is dead named constantly. He is forced to be like the obedient good young lady wearing dresses and things like that. So throughout most of the book that's happening to him, um, just as just in case that makes you uncomfortable to read. And yeah, I just I thought it was super cute. I had also just watched Pride and Prejudice. So I feel like watching it and then reading this back to back, it was just like, ooh, great. So yeah, highly recommend most ardently just a sweet, cute little Pride and Prejudice retelling most ardently. After that, oh my god, I feel like I've talked about this a ton, so forgive me, but I finally read The Library at Mount Char. I've heard so much about this and people all say it's like the weirdest book they've ever read. And so obviously I had to give it a try. I really enjoyed this and I enjoyed it specifically because it reminded me of the Locked Tomb series. So Gideon the Nine, Harrow, Nona, Where is Alecto? Um, those books. This book is about a strange group of children who are raised by father. Um, how do I talk about it without, I don't want to give too much away. What does it say online? Okay, okay, so it does tell you this. All right, so basically their father is, may or may not be God or a God. Um, and so they are raised, they like study his massive library and they're each given a thing to study it's kind of like you know babel where they can't they can never like tell each other what they're studying because you know nobody can have only god can have all the knowledge right um but one day he goes missing and what do you do when god goes missing and full warning this book has every kind of violence you can think of okay we have sexual assault that is described in detail. We have domestic violence. God, I don't even know what you would call, like mm, saying child abuse is too little 
a word, honestly. We have violence against animals, anything you can think of. It's described and it's described in detail. So just know that going in, but it was very just like darkly funny in a way. Like at first it really wasn't and then it got absurd and then it got funny. I just don't wanna say too much, but I would highly recommend when people say this is the weirdest book they've ever read, I don't think writing wise it was difficult to understand. I think it was just more the plot was kind of bonkers. I think like for Harrow the Nine, for example, or like Nona, there's more of like within the writing, it's almost difficult to understand. Like there's something in the actual words, but for Library of Mount Char, it was more like, conceptually. <laughs> it was strange. I recommend it. I also found it really funny that the main character has my full name and that's never happened to me before. It was bizarre to read of all the characters I've ever read. The most insane <laughs> would have my name. So um, it was an experience for sure. Other Carolyn's, watch out. But yeah, definitely, definitely recommend Library of Mount Char. The next one, I believe I heard about this from Lexi. Again, I had to wait a while for it at the library. And this is The Square of Sevens. This was an odd one. It was all about fortune telling, specifically through cards, and the life of this one girl in the 1700s in England, mainly in London and Bath. I was fascinated. I was so drawn in. And then I was like, I looked down and I realized I was only like 60% of the way through and I felt like I had been reading forever. So for some reason, this book felt really long. I do think there was payoff at the end, but there definitely was a dip in it, like kind of the last third of the book where I was a little bored. But I do just think if you like reading books in London, specifically in the 1700s, and it was also historically accurate. A funny thing is that in Most Ardently, which I just talked about, there's a scene where Oliver and Darcy and Bingley go to this place called the Bartholomew Fair. And I thought like, oh, they just made up the name of a fair so that they could have like a boy's day, <laughs> whatever, you know? But then in the Square of Sevens, they mentioned it. And I was like, no way. So I looked it up and sure enough, the Bartholomew Fair is a real thing that happened in London in that time period. So the more you know. Um, so it, it was like a very interesting kind of historical family drama that involves not only card related fortune telling, but then eventually a little bit of astrology and stuff like that. We basically follow a girl who doesn't know too much about her life and then she keeps getting clues about her life and she thinks that she's an orphan, but she's sort of like, mm, all of these things added up points to me not, not being that. I don't wanna spoil anything, but she follows the trail. Um, and it leads her to high society, London. And I think it was a really good time. So again, too long, kind of waned, but the square of sevens, I recommend. Next up is an arc that I, again, was looking forward to a lot. And this was a softer DNF. Um, to gaze upon wicked gods was more like, I'm so lost in the sauce and like not having fun with where this is going. This one was more of just like, this isn't for me, right now or maybe ever. It was a softer DNF, okay? Um, and this is mm, Lore of the Wilds. I got this off of NetGalley, so I had to write a review of it. And as I was writing it, I was sort of saying like, you know, it, it was odd that the writing style felt very like on the younger end of YA, but the content was an older YA. It was just like an odd combination. And then I looked it up and it's actually being marketed as an adult fantasy, which I would have never guessed because of the writing style and like the, the age that the writing felt like. So for me, it was just like my brain couldn't put those two together, I guess. This is a story about a girl who is raised in this town where they are controlled and kept in this very small space by the Fae that have magic and that have forbidden them from going into the forest and, and just really like putting these people in a really horrible position. She's just trying to make ends meet, right? She runs the apothecary with her aunt. She also helps out at the kind of orphanage and child shelter and stuff like that. Just trying to keep this community going. A bunch of things happen at once. We have the Fae come in unannounced and demand to see the owner of the apothecary. And instead of saying that it's her aunt, the girl says, it's her. <laughs> and then right after that, there's like a massive earthquake 
that destroys most of the town. And so she gets taken off to the palace with these fae, and all she can think about is her town that, even at its best, was struggling and now they're struggling with this horrible destruction from a natural disaster right and so she just wants to get she just wants to like whatever the fae want let's get it done go back help rebuild my community right that's all she wants but she gets there and she is given a task that's gonna take a lot longer she's basically forced to clean and categorize this library that for some reason the fae can't go in it's in the palace but they are not they there's some magical force field where the fae can't go in and because they found out that she knows how to read various different languages she's perfect for the job i don't want to get too far into it but there are some turns the girl maybe has some secrets maybe some secret powers okay so based on that i was like yes okay magical library where she has to like sort books I could read that all day. So I would give it a try because it might hit for you, but as I was reading it, I just like a lot of things were kind of instantaneous and I felt like the writing was again, just like younger sounding. It wasn't written badly, but it was just like a younger tone, like the word choices maybe, or just the sentence structure. It felt like it was written for a young audience. And then there were certain things that happened in the book that were not YA coded. So I just didn't, I wasn't, vibing with it. I wanted it to be a kind of different pace. But that being said, please give it a try because really I was highly anticipating it. I've been following the author on Bookstagram for so long. I know that she worked so hard on it and she's so proud of it. So definitely please make up your own mind about it. Um, but that was just a soft putting it aside DNF. Next up, as the sun sets, I might have to turn on the light soon. An incredibly short book, 60 pages. Wonderful. Which pisses me off because I waited for this book for like six weeks at the library and like people held on to their copies for 21 days, like the maximum time. And I was sort of like, it's 60 pages, my man. The English understand wool. This was so satisfying. I did not know what it was going to be about. And by the time it ended, I was like, oh, <laughs> I just read it a whole story. This was so fun. I would love to see this made into film or a short film or something. I think it would be so funny to see visually. But we follow a woman who is writing about her life, what went on in a certain time period. What we discover is that she was raised incredibly wealthy, like so wealthy, jetting between like Paris, mostly spending time in Morocco, often being in the UK, stuff like that, and just like spending so much money and <laughs> just living this incredibly lavish lifestyle until one day her mother disappears. We start to learn that maybe her life wasn't what she thought it was, and then we start to get these letters back and forth between her and her editor because now she's writing a memoir about this period of her life and apparently her and the editors are not seeing eye to eye and it ends up being just like a funny book that again that last page it's just like a satisfying read and even though i didn't think the story was like wow my life has changed or anything it was just a fun time i think and again i feel like it would make such a fun little film um if anyone wants to adapt it but yeah, um, the English understand wool. If you've got the time for 60 pages, it was a good one. Next up is a book that I shouldn't have liked. <laughs> right off the bat, the first couple chapters I was like, uh-oh, <laughs> this isn't for me. Um, I don't normally like books about really rich kids, and I normally don't like books that rely heavily on talking about social media and like how many followers you have, and oh my god, I just posted this thing. Those are typically books that I'm immediately kind of like, about and this book had that as like the center of the plot and you know what I was okay with it I would save this book for Halloween read this during Halloween don't read it in the middle of February because it was a, a little bizarre save this for a Halloween read and that is there's no way I'd die first this was a weird one I'm not sure like I loved it I love it as much as one could love a horror movie that they watched in the middle of February <laughs> this is a horror story about a girl who has this 
movie club where she mainly focuses on black horror films and so there's a lot of references to specifically to get out or us but a lot of others as well and she is hosting like a huge party that's gonna like help boost her numbers like she wants to gain a certain following so that she can be like boosted to the next level and like she wants to get into film school and like all this stuff and so she's inviting all of her like super popular social media friends and they're all going to have a movie night and they're gonna like live stream it whatever again social media they're getting the likes getting the subscribers so a lot of it bounces back and forth between like what is happening in real time and then also like podcast episodes so it was it was kind of fun in that sense to read she hires someone to come help for the event and very quickly you realize that this person um, didn't understand the brief, maybe, let's just say, and it turns into a full-on horror film. I really felt like I was watching a film. That's one thing for sure. Like, it was written very much like it was gonna play out on a screen, and I, I really liked that part of it. I don't think, like, any of the messaging was super deep, but, like, I don't think it was meant to be. Like, this was just meant to be a slasher book, <laughs> and it did that so I would say like only read it if those things seem to appeal to you but if you are interested in horror I definitely had a good time with it again I felt it would have been really good if I read it in Halloween time save it for October but that is there's no way I'd die first <laughs> next up is a DNF that I only DNF because I ran out of time um because it was a I thought it was a short story this was much longer than I thought it was and that is ring shout so I have read one of my favorite books actually from last year, Masters of Gin, um, is by this author. And so I was immediately like, ring shout, yes, let's see what this is about. Super interesting, I will give it another try when I have the time, but I was at 30% and it was just not gonna happen in time for me. Um, this is in an alternative America <laughs> where we have the KKK, but then we also have the Ku Kluxers, or like the Klux Klaners or something. There's like different levels. So we have like the KKK who are just like shitty humans. Okay, shitty's nice, but like humans. And then there's these other people who are like zombie, vampire, monster things, like actual monsters, okay? And it all revolves around Birth of a Nation, the film. And like if people watch it, they, can get brainwashed and they become these like monsters and so it's from the first 30 percent it was just like people going on like a huge monster hunting spree like the first 50 pages were just like a stakeout where these girls were waiting with their guns to like shoot up some zombie racist zombies <laughs> it was like darkly funny and weird and i wanted to continue <laughs> but i just didn't have the time so that is ring shout if that sounds interesting to you like it was a dystopian would i say paranormal darkly funny historical novel <laughs> i will go back into it i will mark my words but um that was as much as i read of ring shout it also was written um, they used a lot of this one particular language that is kind of like Creole and it was so interesting and by the like you know when you read a book that has an accent written kind of verbatim and the voice in your head reads like that I had that voice in my head for a really long time so um, it was a very immersive book for the little amount that I read of it I recommend it ring shout. After that, another kind of shorter book that I had to wait a long time for was Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead. I have heard so much about this book, finally got my hands on it, read it in like two solid sittings, and I didn't expect it to be funny. Like, I don't know what I expected out of this book. I went in knowing nothing, and it was actually like a kind of, especially in the beginning, like a kind of funny, darkly, darkly funny book. Um, it's very satisfying. It's about a woman who lives on the Polish-Czech border, and it's an area where a lot of people have their like summer homes, but she stays there over winter. She lives there full time. She just kind of like shuffles to everybody's house to like check on it, make sure it's safe over winter. And there's like two other people in her neighborhood. And in the very beginning of the book, 
one of them dies. We follow her through, like there's an investigation and she thinks some things have happened and no one's taking her seriously. And then like more people start dying and it's just, it just starts to get a little absurd. Like there's definitely, you start to question the narrator and like, wait, a, what's going on? Yeah, I thought that the ending was really great um and again i didn't expect it to have a dark humor to it but it definitely did and um a, an easy great read that is drive your plow over the bones of the dead oh my gosh yay i'm so excited next up i finally read emily wilde's map of the other lands i did a quick reread of the encyclopedia of fairies so that i could dive into map of the other lands my critique remains the same with Encyclopedia of Fairies is that the pacing was really bizarre. I felt like there was a false ending. <laughs> Basically in these books we follow Emily Wilde who is a researcher of fairies and in the first book she's working on her Encyclopedia of Fairies and she needs to do some research in this island that's like in the Arctic Circle off of Norway somewhere and she stays there for a few months I think to do research on the fairies in that area. It's just like a cute little like small town I almost said small town romance it's not it's like just this small town that slowly warms to her with all these like very strange characters we also have her research partner who is not technically her partner but he just like shows up wherever she is um and he is a hoot I've heard people say and maybe I said it myself um that it's a little bit Howl's Moving Castle like Howl and Sophie but if they were reversed like I feel like well you know what no I actually think that the the main main male character is like Howell and Sophie at the same time <laughs> and I think that Emily is just a really fun character because she's not a typical female protagonist whatsoever she reminds me a lot actually especially in the second book if you ever watched the tv show Bones which I love I'm doing a very slow rewatch of it right now actually um she reminds me a lot of that like or almost like in a Sherlock Holmes way where she is so focused on like the case or the research that she ends up being socially very strange and sometimes a little rude I really liked that about her during the encyclopedia of fairies there's like a quest that she goes on and when it finishes I kind of think like oh well that that would be like a good ending to the book but then there's like another quest that happens um and so I think that that way of writing kind of made the book a little strange just in terms of that pacing and like general storytelling that did end up setting up some things for the next book so I understand but I think the second book she really got the story to be just like a perfect like it just it just had that perfect arc to it I never felt like it lulled this one we are searching for a magical door to the fairy world and it takes us to Switzerland and I mean this in the best way the plot for this book and sort of the encyclopedia um but mostly for map of the other lands i feel like these plots feel small but like i said in a good way like it didn't feel like an epic fantasy it just felt like this episode in their lives and it was like quaint and just uh, i don't know how to describe it like other than just it felt small but wonderful um, and I really enjoyed it and there was a lot more dog content in the second one and it was it was like funnier I don't know like just overall I think that I liked map even more than encyclopedia I highly recommend them to you especially if you love a female protagonist that is not the stereotypical quirky funny strong girl you know Emily Wilde Let's talk about another arc that I got, and this one is bizarre, and I would love to hear other people's thoughts on this. This is one of our kind. It is described as the Stepford Wives meets Get Out. This book takes place mostly in a town called Liberty, which is a newly created town outside of Los Angeles where it is meant to be a black utopia. So the only people who can live there are black. It's run by this like kind of entrepreneur shady <laughs> character, but it seems to be this, like I said, utopia. Perfect, wonderful. And we follow our main character who is a woman who is very committed to raising up the black community. Um, her and her husband both, they have their own jobs that in and of themselves 
help the community, but then they go even further than that and they are mentors, they're organizers, they're doing all this stuff. And so no brainer that they would move to Liberty, right? To see what this is. So they've moved into their new mansion um, with their son and things seem to be okay. But the longer that she lives there, the longer that she feels like something isn't right. Like why is there no Black Lives Matter chapter for Liberty? Why is it when she brings it up, people don't wanna join? Why is everybody hanging out at this weird spa slash country club? And like, why does it feel low key culty? And like, why just like, there's things that don't make her feel good, but there's also things that make her feel really good. Like the fact that her son can go to elementary school with all black teachers that like, don't talk down to him, are never going to question him in terms of like, mm, is he smart enough? You know, like it eliminates so many hardships of his life. As things go down, I mean, it's compared to the Stepford Wives and Get Out, so like, but I found it to be really like interesting and like overall I liked it in terms of it being like this kind of horror, this contemporary horror story. And in the author's note at the end, she very specifically said like she wrote this book to start a conversation and I think it will do that because I don't know if this took a stance. like. It sort of made even our main character, she was kind of imperfect. Like she was a little over the top. There were many times where she was very judgmental of other specifically black women, judging their hairstyles and judging their choices and stuff like that, or judging, you know, their social media and stuff like that. And then on the other hand, we've got like, mm -hmm a different turn. <laughs> and it just like wasn't clear. I don't think um, the author really took a stance in terms of like, maybe the stance is that just like the black community cannot and will not be a monolith and there's no right way to engage with like your community. I'm not really sure, but I would just really love once this comes out, I'd love to hear from like other black book reviewers of what their takes are because for me, I was just sort of like, I'm not sure <laughs> what in terms of like what I'm, what lesson I'm necessarily supposed to take out of this. I think just as a book, it was written very well and very engagingly and I was very creeped out the whole time. Um, but in terms of like, what did I walk away from it with? Um, it was really just questions and the eagerness to listen to other reviewers, um, specifically reviewers from the black community. So I think that she accomplished what she wanted, which was like, let's start a conversation about things. And she did it in a ballsy way. So that is one of our kind. If you have read it, please let me know your thoughts. And then I read another arc. I was really down about my NetGalley review percentage. Um, so I worked really hard this month to read those books to get my percentage back up and it worked because I ended up getting the Ali Hazelwood arc. So you put in the work, you get something back. Um, so another arc that I read was When Among Crows. This was written by the same author as Divergent who I have never read Divergent. I've never read any of their other work. So I don't know what their regular writing style is, but this was, I thought, really good. It was it was quite short. That's one complaint that I have is that I just really wanted more. I would love for her to make more work within this world. And I also made a TikTok about it, comparing it to One for My Enemy in the kind of aesthetic that it had. When Among Crows follows, how do I even explain this book? Opening scene. We have this like god creature that is meant to guard this flower that only blooms one day a year. And this random guy, like just normie human guy comes in and he's like, hey, sup, I would like to pick that flower, please. And the god is like, okay, uh, you gotta fight for it. You can't just pick it. It's not gonna be easy. And he tries to pick it anyway, goes through this horrible trial. And for some reason he's allowed to pick it. Like whatever the like magic scans him and is like, actually his heart's good. So there you go. So then he embarks on this adventure that is kind of too difficult to explain, but it's a lot of like 
underground dealings with a bunch of different kinds of people like vampires and this kind of thing but it's strongly linked to Polish mythology we've got Baba Yaga we've got all these people um so there's a lot of like Polish language in it just like a lot of Polish myths that I thought was really interesting it was just a good time it was very urban fantasy grungy it takes place in modern day Chicago it was a lot of like late nights dripping dirty alleyways underground nightclubs that are also fight clubs and stuff like that I just enjoyed it I, I again wish it was longer it could have used I could have gone like another hundred pages I really recommend it almost made me want to read Divergent but I feel like I already have based on how much knowledge booktube has forced down my throat about that series so um when among crows I will put when it's coming out up here um also recommend took a break to turn a lamp on because we still have more to go I can't believe this I read so much to be fair a lot of these books were shorter the next book I read this is a standalone fantasy right yeah I'm pretty sure this was a standalone that could be continued but I liked it as it was and this is the infinity alchemist this is a story about a world in which there are alchemists but only certain people are allowed to be alchemists and to use their powers and anyone who studies by themselves is in deep trouble and our main character studies by himself obviously he is unable to attend the university that he wants to go to the academy that is where all great alchemists go so he finds his way in as a groundskeeper and just kind of absorbs anything he can about alchemy he loves it so much and when he gets caught doing a little bit of magic he gets wrapped up in a partnership with a graduate student who is trying to prove something. It's another one of these like magical researcher books, kind of like Emily Wilde, and it leads us on this adventure that kind of unravels the entire alchemist community. I will say that like everything happened really easily and it didn't feel like there were really any stakes because you knew that things would get fixed and fixed quickly so it was kind of just like honestly a comforting read because I was sort of like even though there were allegedly stakes there were a lot of like mini crises I was sort of like mm, sit back and relax don't worry about it you know if you're looking for like a really tense novel this is not gonna do it but I still really enjoyed the world I really enjoyed the characters there was a lot of talk about gender representation our main character is trans our other main character is so gender fluid that they're constantly switching pronouns and I believe even like physically they're changing like it was it all was linked to your past lives it was it was really interesting like what they were talking about and so a lot of the story actually was just revolved around the characters and their lives so it wasn't like a gripping edge of your seat novel but i still really liked it for what it was and i think it's really valuable and i had a good time with it so that is the infinity alchemist my next read i read so many books that had like Halloween themes. I don't know why I was reading so many horror books or like vampire books this month. I finally got my hands on the vampires of El Norte and my battery is dying. I'll be right back. Okay, vampires of El Norte. I loved this much more than the Hacienda. I can't pinpoint why exactly. This follows a girl who is raised in a very wealthy like ranchero family, so she's a landowner, and then there's all of these people who live on the land and work the land for her father, and one day she happens to be out at night and she gets attacked by something. How do I talk about this without spoiling? I don't know how much I'm allowed to say. <laughs> so yeah, this, take this takes place in the 1840s in Mexico, in Northern Mexico. Okay, I guess this isn't spoiling it. All right, so she is believed to be dead. She looks dead, she is dead, all right? And so her lover, who was going to propose to her, like his whole life is structured around getting enough money to buy land so he can be worthy of marrying the ranchero's daughter. It is so sweet. Um, and then he's like, holy shit, she died and maybe I'm at fault. So he runs away, not knowing that she in fact woke up 
alive. And so many years pass, our main girl is now working mainly as a healer for um, all the people on the ranch, and our main guy is like just running around being kind of like a rancher wherever he's needed. Then he gets summoned back to his original ranch because there's rumblings of a war with the United States and it's every ranchero for himself kind of thing. So they're trying to rally the troops literally and fight off the Anglos. And in the background, there's things literally lurking in the shadows that the more that we learn about them, the more that it feels like there's some vampire shit going down. So I really loved it. Anything that takes place on a ranch, like specifically in that time period, my American girl was Josefina. Like I love that growing up like in Southern California, a lot of our state history that we learned as kids was very focused on like that ranchero culture. So I just always love reading about stuff in that time period in that space so i just loved the imagery um throughout the book i do think that kind of in the middle i got a little bit bored and i was sort of like just tell me what happens <laughs> like i just want to know but i do think that like the first half and then the, the ending was very solid i think it, i just always get a little caught at like the three quarter mark with a lot of books where i'm just i sort of want to skip to the end um this was one of them but maybe that was also just me i still Highly recommend it if all of those things kind of, those are boxes that tick for you. Please read Vampires of El Norte. Also that cover, whew, so good. <laughs> Ooh, I have a physical. After that, I finally finished the entire series. I only have the physical for the second one, so that was weird to switch mediums. But Defy the Night, Defend the Dawn, destroy the day I think is what they all are. This is a trilogy that I started in 2020 or 2021. I think it was early 2021 but I talked about this before and this was just an unfortunate coincidence that the author Bridget Kemmerer who wrote A Curse So Dark and Lonely she created the first book in 2019 sent it to her editor at the beginning of 2020 and realized, oh no, I wrote a book about a pandemic and vaccine distribution and the corrupt government. And now it's 2020 <laughs> and COVID is unfolding. And so they had to like workshop it a bit. Um, but at the end of the day, the core of this book is still about a pandemic and vaccines and <laughs> corrupt governments. So um, that was like a difficult book to read in 2021 when myself and others especially here in Korea were struggling to get vaccines and like it was just a like I wasn't in the right mental space I thought it was good I thought it was a good young adult fantasy um but I just thought like time and place not for me uh 2021 so I put it off until the last book came out and read it all in one go so I will say that this was definitely a trilogy that was supposed to be a duology. It feels very... This book in particular was a very strange turn of events, but I didn't hate it. We're basically following a girl who lives outside of the palace, and she and her partner are constantly breaking into the royal quarter, stealing the extra medicine, um, and bringing it back to the people who can't afford to get that medicine by themselves like they give you a very minimum amount and then if you want any more you have to pay more um and so obviously the rich are like basically taking the vaccine three times a day versus people out there are getting it like once a week right and so of course then like i'm not saying she gets caught but like things happen she ends up having to live in the palace for a little bit the book basically all surrounds the government and how they're handling this pandemic in pops this book this book, she literally just brings in a whole nother country. <laughs> She's just like, how can I tell this story longer? In this book, we get a visitor from another kingdom that for some reason isn't having a pandemic and they may or may not have a large quantity of the materials that is needed for the vaccine. But of course, we're not getting that for free. They have something from our kingdom that they desperately need. He's a shady, shady character, this ambassador from another land, and so we end up traveling to a completely other country, and so this book and 
the next book in the series, the finale, honestly takes place mostly not in... Actually, wait a sec. Okay, yeah. Um, this book and the next book take place mostly in a different setting than we had at all. This book is mainly on a ship and it feels very piratey. <laughs> um, so it's very different. I do think once I got over that kind of jostle of a, whoa, we just added a whole nother book to this trilogy, I did still enjoy it. I think that it was a very good young adult book. Like it definitely read a little young and I think that's okay. It was all very fade to black. I think too many things were fade to black. I will say some of it was done for like dramatic effect of like, oh my god, did he die? And some things are for like closed door, fade to black, intimate scenes. So yeah, I do think it's it's really good for like a younger, young adult audience. I don't know, I had a good time with it. I think that she really demonstrated the complications of, I guess like just juggling the politics and like everything that is needed to help an entire nation get through something. Yeah, just overall. I was not mad at it. I had a good time. I really liked reading the trilogy all back to back. Felt very enveloped in the world. Liked the characters. Liked the romances. Plural. Defy the night. Really quick. So this is why I have so many books this month is because a lot of the books I'm reading are like under 100 pages. Just so you know. <laughs> but this is Good Morning Midnight. I had heard about this book in the sense that it is a life-changing brain altering classic. I wouldn't go that far, but um, it was really beautiful in its own right. This is basically just a portrait of depression and heartbreak. We follow a woman who goes back to Paris after her heart has been broken and she just kind of drinks her way through her memories like everywhere she goes she's like oh can't go in that cafe because I've got a memory and if I sit down I'm gonna feel like a wave of panic or like melancholy or something come over me and like a lot of times she's drunk so her memories and like the way that she's telling the story it really feels like if you sat down at a bar and a drunk person just told you about their heartbreak <laughs> it really felt like this but at the same time, there were a lot of these really wonderful lines and, and ideas about sadness and about um, just like how hard it is to be a human and how hard it is to be a sad human in particular. Um, so I do think that there were lots and lots of beautiful moments in this book, but honestly, if I hadn't been on three back-to-back -back really long bus rides, I don't know if I would have pushed through and finished it. Um, it wasn't like, again, I didn't feel like my life was changing in any way, but at the end of the day, I am glad that I read it. I underlined a lot. Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily rush to it. Maybe it feels differently if you're in the middle of a heartbreak. So if you are, I hope you aren't, but if you are, maybe give it a try. This is Good Morning Midnight. And my last arc uh, that I read was The Haunting of Velkwood. This is another kind of horror <laughs> supernatural story. This wasn't bad. It wasn't good, but I still liked it and I would still recommend. This follows a woman who is like, live in a rough life as a 30 maybe 40 something year old but 20 ish years ago some horrible thing happened in her neighborhood and only herself and two of her friends survived we get we get the story in kind of pieces but essentially there there's like some bizarre phenomenon where her neighborhood her tiny little street her little cul-de-sac is like enveloped in this fog and no one can get in or out. It really felt like Annihilation, if you have ever read that, like it had that kind of vibe. And it seems like the only people who can break that barrier and walk into the neighborhood are the three girls who escaped it, like the people who belong there. But one girl went in just as an experiment and she came out really messed up in the head. And so no one has gone back since and like you can't take pictures like no one no one knows it's just foggy weird stuff it's this and like the u.s government has been studying it like nobody knows what this phenomenon is our main girl is approached by a researcher who like she gets approached all the time because it's just an interesting phenomenon people study but he approaches her and he has what other people have not had which is a drone photo in which she looks at her house 
and she can see, just as she suspected, that her little sister is standing at the bedroom window looking out. And her sister has been eight years old for 20 years. So it's very much like we know that they're they're just like ghosts. They're frozen in time. Weird shit going on. So that convinces her like, okay, I'm gonna go get my sister. Like, I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing this for my sister. And we follow her as she tries to break in to her neighborhood and like figure out what happened and then we realize like maybe these girls have some secrets of themselves you know so again it wasn't my favorite i think that it was kind of a missed opportunity to flesh out all the other characters like we really were just with our main character but i was so interested in the researcher i was so like i think it would have been better served if we fleshed out other characters as well instead of just focusing on our main girl but I thought the story was quite interesting it took several turns that I didn't think it was going to like I thought the mystery was about X and the mystery was really about Y and Z so not perfect but definitely um, if that sounds interesting if you're more into the horror genre I would still give it a try I definitely I read it in one night actually like I was just laying in bed and I was just like <laughs> so it was gripping and it was easy to read perhaps a really good like travel book even though it's quite eerie so maybe not but um that is the haunting of velkwood oh my gosh the sun is gone guys i'm sorry we are almost done we're almost done i have a dnf that was similar to ring shout really good but i just did not have the time to finish it and it was it had to be returned to the library and people are waiting for it so i had to return it and that is mother of strangers this takes place in palestine actually in the 40s and like the 30s and 40s which i have read literature about kind of present day palestine or palestine in the 80s but this is palestine before israel was really ever created and so it was super interesting to read kind of that like slow infiltration um a lot about like britain and their role in it but it's told at least as far as i read it's told through the eyes of this young boy who's just a brilliant mechanic slash engineer. His whole focus is just like getting enough money so that he can buy a fancy suit, so that he can propose to the girl that he's in love with. He's 16, she's like 13, like these kids are not getting married anytime soon, okay? But he's still like, he's dreaming big. And so for him, he's like, well, I really want to make money so I need to work with these like Euro Europeans, but I also want to defend Palestine and so he goes to all of the protests and and things like that. It's just very interesting seeing his life. So I only got so far but I do recommend it if you're looking for more literature on Palestine. Learned a lot. It made me want to eat a lot of oranges. <laughs> Strangely enough. Um, that is Mother of Strangers. Really quick, this is a very recently released book that I've been waiting for, um, and that is The Blueprint. It was compared a lot to Octavia E. Butler, so I was like, <laughs> say less, yes. I will say I, I felt feelings about this book because the night before I started it, I watched American Fiction, which I highly recommend, and I'm waiting to get that book from the library because it's based off of a book. But American Fiction, um, to sidetrack, is a film about this author who is just not getting published because he's a black man, but he doesn't write about the black experience in the way that like the white public wants him to. So like these horrible stories about like growing up on the streets and like gang stuff and jail stuff, like all this. Um, he's just like, that's not me. I'm a doctor. I'm from a family of doctors. I grew up like in New England, hella wealthy. Like that's not, I'm not gonna, <laughs> that's not my world. He gets so frustrated that as a joke, he writes a very stereotypical like what white people want like the white guilt readers want to read about the black experience and he ends up getting like a crazy book deal and so we follow him <laughs> on that journey so having just watched a film about like people exploiting the black experience i was really worried going into blue the blueprint because it is about specifically black people being put in these horrific situations and so I was sort of like Ugh. but as I was reading it it didn't feel 
hokey. It didn't feel like a show. Um, the blueprint is, like I said, very much like The Handmaiden's Tale, um, where the men are allowed to be soldiers, kind of. Like, they're relatively able to, like, live their lives but the women are always put in this like lottery system. It's called, actually, it's called the algorithm, I'm pretty sure. They get matched with white men and they have to live with these white men, I think like minimum five years, maybe more, um, just as they're like basically sex slave. It's not, it's more like a companion, but like what most white men are using it for is a sex slave alongside their wives and their kids. So it's very dark, but the state of Louisiana is a free zone. So everyone is like, just do your time, get your white man to sign the emancipation papers and move to Louisiana and you'll be fine. So that's really just what our girl wants to do is get it over with, hopefully get a really nice white man and like get her freedom. Obviously we learned that that it's not what happens, but the people that she ends up being assigned to are also like not what you'd expect. It's very complicated. So yeah, if you're a fan of Octavia E. Butler and specifically The Handmaiden's Tale, I know that that's like not for everybody. Even for me, The Handmaiden's Tale was really difficult to read. This one, the like talk of sexual assault is a lot less. Like it's not about making babies. It's about just control and yeah I would I would definitely give it a go if those two things sound up your alley um the blue print but very dark I mean trigger warnings everywhere right the blueprint we're almost done I'm gonna be really quick about these two because I made an entire video about them I read Bride by Allie Hazelwood her first paranormal romance I thought it was very good I didn't think it was like insane I didn't think it was like the best paranormal romance I've ever read, but it was just really great. And I think that she toned down everything that people say is like annoying about Allie Hazelwood, which I don't say. I love her even if she says that her man is the size of Mount Everest, okay? She toned it all down. Like her main character is very different than her other female protagonists. Um, where basically it's a marriage of convenience or more like a forced marriage, I guess. Like basically our main girl is, for lack of a better word, she's like a vampire princess. And in order to maintain peace between the vampires, werewolves, and humans, she gets married to the alpha of the werewolves. And she may have a different motive for why she volunteered to get married. Um, and we unravel some stuff, basically. I don't want to go too far into it again, but yeah. I enjoyed it and I think even if you don't like Allie Hazelwood or like you aren't a contemporary romance person so you've never read her and you've heard things, um, I would still give it a go. I think it was just a solid romance and yes, now I do know what nodding is. <laughs> After that I read Funny Story which is actually, ooh that's an arc too, sorry. Um, it's coming out very soon though, I believe, and this is by Emily Henry. This was just a solid small town fake dating slash roommates romance that was just about healing from trauma, specifically trauma of like toxic parents. So I think at some point, just because I'm usually not interested in like family drama books, for me, I got a little bored. I do think that it was sweet. It was also very realistic, like in terms of a romantic comedy, there weren't many like silly over the top moments. Like it just really felt like this couple could definitely exist and their entire storyline was so believable. And it was sweet. It was just like showing her around this small town in Michigan. She's a child's librarian that moved there just to be with her husband and the day before they're about to get married he realizes that he's in love with his childhood best friend and leaves her he's like yeah you've got i'll give you the rest of the night i'm gonna go sleep at my new girlfriend's house um but you can be out of here by tomorrow right so we're dealing from we're dealing with that trauma and trauma of bad parents and it was cute it was fine <laughs> and last but not least, goodness me, it is late. It is time for dinner. I am hungry. My last book is a book of the month book from January. This is First Lie Wins. This was not what I expected. This was a weird one. This is a thriller and it says on the inside cover, 
okay? So this is not a spoiler. We are following a girl named Evie who is just about to move in with her boyfriend and everything seems great, it's perfect. She just needs to convince his like giant friend group that he, she's normal and can be accepted. But the main problem with that is that Evie doesn't exist. Evie is an alias. Evie, or the woman behind Evie, she works for this mysterious crime boss who like basically just gives her new identities and a mark and is like, we need you to get this information or we need you to make sure this person doesn't get this job. And so she infiltrates their lives, fucks them up, and leaves. So that's what Evie's doing here, but the tables turn more than once. It's like a job within a job within a job within a job. And so even though I didn't love how it ended, um, I still just needed to finish it. I needed to know what happened. I made a TikTok comparing this a little bit to Jason Bourne, and it definitely does feel a little bit like Jason Bourne without the car chases and also taking place mostly in the Southern United States. <laughs> yeah, First Light Wins. Um, if you like thrillers, this was a good one. I recommend. So my god that's it that's all i read we just had like a lot of vacation days and days where i didn't want to go outside and a lot of shorter books this month so oh a man just came to inform me that they're gonna do construction all week next week next door it's gonna be loud so cool anyway that's it that was that was my month um thank you for being here thank you again to book of the month let me uh pass the mic to carrie who's hopefully in a not noisy space <laughs> the construction is literally starting right now um so i'm gonna be quick thank you so much to book of the month once again for sponsoring this you can use my code chirp for March to get your first book for $9.99. Highly recommend you check out the titles this month as well as every month. But yes, thank you so much always to Book of the Month and I will pass you back to quiet, calm evening me instead of chaotic, loud morning me, okay? And I will see you guys next time. Thank you always. Let me know what you're reading, etc. I'll see you, okay?